Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Blake Davis and Hannah Quinn? This is one of the strangest cases of self-defense that I've seen in a while. A case where the victims of a violent crime were convicted as perpetrators. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll start with the timeline of the crime, then I'll move to my analysis. This case takes place in Forest Lodge, Australia, which is an inner city suburb of Sydney. On August 10, 2018, Hannah Quinn was returning to the house where she lived with her boyfriend, Blake Davis. She had just made a purchase at a local restaurant. She noticed a man outside the house who was looking around in a suspicious manner. This man was 30-year-old Jet McKee. McKee put on a balaclava and made entry through the door of the couple's house after Hannah Quinn entered the house. He was armed with brass knuckles, pepper spray, zip ties, and a pistol loaded with blanks. He pointed the gun at the couple and demanded money and valuables. Davis and Quinn would later claim that McKee said that his associates would come back later and kill them and their families if they did not give in to his demands. McKee punched Davis using the brass knuckles. The strike knocked Davis unconscious and broke his left eye socket in several places. McKee attempted to steal Quinn's handbag, which was still wrapped around her shoulder. The struggle moved outside as McKee was trying to pull the handbag off of her shoulder. Quinn would later say that she didn't know why she simply didn't let him have the handbag. McKee managed to pull the handbag away from Quinn and he started running down the street. Quinn pursued him. This was another behavior she would have trouble explaining later. Quinn was able to catch up with McKee and grabbed her handbag back from him after chasing him for about 260 feet. McKee, who still had the brass knuckles in his right hand, tried to punch Quinn, but she backed up and he missed. He fell to the ground because he overcommitted to the punch. He then pointed the gun at Quinn using his left hand. As this was going on, Davis woke up. He was in a great deal of pain and disoriented. He believed he had been shot by McKee. Davis heard Quinn screaming. He grabbed a samurai sword and ran out into the street. He came upon Quinn and McKee. Davis would claim that he didn't remember what happened in that moment or immediately after that, but he knew that Quinn was in danger. Davis struck McKee in the head with the sword mortally wounding him. Davis and Quinn started running as they believed McKee was still a threat. Even though he was mortally wounded, McKee did rise to his feet and he walked a short distance before collapsing and dying. Davis and Quinn ran back to their house and packed up a number of belongings, including over $20,000 in cash, nunchucks, and a pellet gun. They hid the samurai sword. After this, they went on the run. They said they did this because McKee was still alive and because McKee had accomplices who were also after the couple. Again, they claim McKee had said as much during the confrontation in the house. The couple went from hotel to hotel. They said they were in fear for their lives, paranoid, and bewildered by the circumstances. They said they were not trying to evade the authorities. A couple of days after hearing on the radio that McKee had died, the couple met with an attorney and surrendered to the police. Before they did this, they left the bag of money behind on a back street. The $20,000 would be recovered later. Both Davis and Quinn were arrested and charged with murder. The investigation revealed a few interesting items. Apparently, McKee had a friend who sold cannabis to Quinn. She, in turn, sold that cannabis to others. So, essentially, she was a drug dealer. McKee's friend was actually his conspirator, they had been casing the house for two days leading up to the robbery. The friend had once seen cash in the couple's home when he was selling cannabis to Quinn. The police would find $3,000 in cash, as well as cannabis, in the couple's house. McKee was a rapper with a long history of violent home invasions. He made videos that featured him doing the same thing he did to Davis and Quinn, putting on a balaclava and conducting a home invasion. So he produced music videos not just for entertainment, but also to offer training sessions for aspiring criminals. Maybe he figured that because he wasn't a very good rapper, the music videos wouldn't get much airplay, 
However, if he was arrested for a home invasion, at least they would be played at his trial. The night before the attack, McKee lost a substantial amount of money gambling. It was reported he had a severe gambling addiction. McKee also appeared to have trouble with substance use. He had a nearly lethal level of crystal methamphetamine in his system at the time of his death. This drug is also referred to as ICE. It appears as though he believed that Davis and Quinn were drug dealers. Therefore, they might have a lot of money in the house. Blake Davis was found not guilty of murder, but he was found guilty of manslaughter. He was sentenced to five years in prison. He has to serve at least two years and nine months. The trial was underway when the judge told the jury to find Hannah Quinn not guilty of murder. She was acquitted on that charge, but she would be convicted of accessory after the fact to manslaughter. She was sentenced to two years of probation. Now moving to my analysis. The Crown, which is the prosecution in Australia, took a very aggressive stance in this case. They alleged that not only was Davis guilty of murder, but that Quinn was a conspirator in that crime. They believe that Davis and Quinn chased McKee down and killed him in the middle of the street in order to send a message to other would-be robbers. The attorney for the defense argued that this was a case of self-defense. McKee was an armed aggressor who perpetrated an unprovoked attack on the couple. Davis simply ended the confrontation. Davis was trying to protect his girlfriend. So were these two really guilty? Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea that Davis and Quinn were guilty, starting with the items that make them appear guilty. Quinn pursued McKee as he fled. He was no longer as threatening at that point, so it's difficult to support the self-defense theory. Witnesses said they didn't see McKee holding or pointing a firearm when he was in the street. The memory loss of Davis seems convenient. There was a secret recording in which Davis said, I tell everyone I can't remember, I know exactly what was going on. So it appears as though he wasn't being honest about what he actually remembered. Davis and Quinn went on the run, and they took an unusual collection of belongings, including nunchucks and that $20,000. They hid the samurai sword, which makes them look guilty. Why hide it if Davis killed in defense of Quinn? They disposed of the $20,000 on a back street. It's almost like that money was evidence of a crime. Perhaps it was earned doing something they should not have been doing. Quinn admitted that she sold cannabis to other people, so she was a drug dealer, although Davis and Quinn denied that the $20,000 was generated through the sale of drugs. Davis said it was a vacation fund that the couple had saved over time. The fact that Quinn did deal drugs makes it seem as though one criminal was simply robbing another in this case, which of course is still illegal, but it doesn't create a lot of sympathy for the victim. The last item that makes them look guilty If Davis was so disoriented after being knocked unconscious, how did he manage to deliver a lethal blow to McKee's head? Now moving to the items that make them look innocent. McKee had a history of violence, including home invasions. He was the aggressor. He was armed with multiple weapons. He caused the confrontation. It was his criminal behavior that put everyone's life in jeopardy, including his own. When he struck Davis using the brass knuckles, he was using lethal force. He could have easily killed Davis. Considering that McKee was holding a gun, Davis's conclusion that he had been shot by McKee was reasonable. When McKee tried to pull the handbag away from Quinn, even though it would have been smarter if she just gave it to him, she had a right to protect her property. McKee's behavior was responsible for the confrontation moving into the street. Essentially, he dragged Quinn out there by pulling on her handbag. Those witnesses I talked about before who did not see a gun also believed that Davis was holding a stick. The closest witness was about 280 feet away. I would not expect them to see a gun or anything of that size at that distance. It is entirely reasonable to believe that if McKee pointed the gun at Davis and Quinn in their residence, he pointed it at them in the street. Even though the little adventure of Davis and Quinn after the incident was unusual, McKee made threats that supported the couple being fearful, and the couple did surrender of their own accord. Mental health factors were used as part of the defense as well. Davis had anxiety and PTSD prior to the attack. Quinn had ADHD prior to the attack. The defense argued that these mental disorders explained some of the odd behavior, like chasing McKee, 
running away after the incident, and dumping the money. So back to that question. Were Davis and Quinn actually guilty? Here are my thoughts. I think what happened in this case is that a dangerous criminal attacked the couple because he was desperate for money so he could continue to gamble and to buy drugs. The couple reacted to the attack in an unusual way, and their behavior after the fact only made them look more guilty. Davis's use of deadly force happened under circumstances where the threat level was not clear. It would have been more clear if he had acted in the house and not in the street. The couple was not sympathetic. The jury didn't believe that McKee pointed a gun at Quinn when they were in the street. They probably weren't too happy about the idea of Quinn selling drugs either. In addition, the attorney representing Davis and Quinn believed that the use of a samurai sword didn't play well with the jury either. Which makes me wonder, what would have been more satisfactory for the jury? If McKee was beaten to death with a lawn chair or like pool noodles or something, would that be okay? What weapon would be acceptable to use in defense of another? When weighing everything together, I believe there was reasonable doubt in this case. I agree the actions of the couple were difficult to explain and may have been criminal, but there's no way to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. The evidence that the Crown had available in this case didn't meet that burden. I would also agree that Davis's use of lethal force in the street appears to be unlawful when it would have been lawful in the house. But this case isn't that straightforward. I think this is one of those situations where the victims were put in an impossible position. Even though Quinn should not have pursued McKee, her pursuit was lawful. She was allowed to chase him. McKee had her property. She was simply trying to recover it. Her pursuit left Davis with fewer options. Quinn had kept herself in a situation where she continued to be under threat. That choice was hers. Davis did not make that choice. So unless Davis and Quinn were in some type of conspiracy, which the evidence does not support, Davis's use of force could have been justified in his mind at that moment. He was defending another person. How that person was in that situation was not his problem. He was allowed to protect the victim, even if that victim didn't necessarily make a good decision. His only objective was to end the threat, which is what he did. I believe the prosecution went overboard in trying to make the victims into the perpetrators because the victim survived and the perpetrator died. If McKee had survived the attack with the sword, I doubt Davis and Quinn would have been tried for any crime at all. The couple was judged harshly for actions they took under extreme duress, which brings me to the mental health component. Could the prior mental health history of Davis and Quinn explain some of their behavior? I think the answer is yes. I'll start with Davis. If somebody has anxiety and PTSD, they are more prone to react in extreme ways to traumatic events. This could manifest by somebody being quite vigorous in their retreat, but it could also manifest with a person being more aggressive. The panic response could be stronger in somebody with those symptoms. Perhaps Davis had more of a need to resolve the confrontation in order to satisfy the anxiety. I think it's also worth noting that Davis had a concussion. Those are usually not associated with logical decision-making. Now moving to Quinn. Not only did Quinn chase after McKee, she went on the run with Davis. Could ADHD explain these behaviors? ADHD is characterized by a number of symptoms, including being impulsive, so poor decision-making seems to be part of it. Under the pressure of a potentially lethal attack, and considering the effects of ADHD, it is reasonable to believe that Quinn was simply reacting and not thinking things through. Lethal and potentially lethal confrontations do not always lead to logical responses in either perpetrators or victims. There have been many fights where a victim starts off as submissive, like they're trying to appease the perpetrator, they're trying to give in to the demands of the perpetrator, but then the victim becomes aggressive. There's not always just one response type. There have been fights where both victims and perpetrators go back and forth between offensive and defensive tactics. When McKee decided to use lethal force against his victims, he put himself in a terrible situation. His death was unfortunate, but foreseeable. The couple will pay for his behavior and their responses for the rest of their lives. So this case was a tragedy for everybody, I don't think it should have resulted in a conviction, but I can understand why the behavior of the couple 
was thought of as suspicious. They did appear to be trying to hide something, and they acted in a way that I think most people would not have acted. Those are my thoughts on the case of Blake Davis and Hannah Quinn. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.